Instruction champions, it's your host, Ron Newsbaum, and we're here for another amazing episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where we're burning down the house and we're rebuilding it. We're driving the bulldozer through the warehouse just to rebuild the warehouse. Every day we're learning something new and we're becoming the champions that we're meant to be. I have an amazing guest here today. Owen, thank you for being on the show. What's up, Ron? Thank you. And it's good to be here reciprocating probably exactly this time last week whilst you guys are on our show as well. Absolutely. It was the exact same time. It's amazing. Uh, but Owen, you have a fantastic podcast. You're you're a legend. I mean, you're on every top 10, top five list when it comes to podcasts in the construction <laughs> industry. You do amazing things for the industry. You're always looking at a forward look of what can be and how can we continue to improve. I'm super excited to do this episode here today, but let's start off with everything that you're doing and everything that you've done. What are you most excited about right now? I'm excited about the future, of course. Like who isn't? I mean, and I say that with a personal bias because obviously with what we're doing on the podcast is very should we say futuristic? We have lots of people, um, construction tech entrepreneurs like yourself, CEOs, founders, venture capitalists, um, advisors, anyone involved in that ecosystem. We're we're constantly talking about like you know technology and how that is gonna hopefully improve the industry. There's no guarantee, and the, the more people I speak about, the less convinced I get, which is a kind of a, a stranger situation to be in, but. You know, we got to keep going. We've got to keep spreading the word, building the communities. Um, yeah, r- right now we're, we're, we are sort of uh, enhancing our community building efforts. Like we, we, we're like me personally, I'm involved in like different tracks within construction. So I work from the consulting side and I, in the U S I'm not sure you have this role, but it's a quantity surveyor, um, which essentially runs the, um, financial side of projects. Uh, I think you guys, I don't know what you call it. Is it project? Like a controller uh, or so a controller would be like for a company wide uh, controlling that money, what that stuff looks like. Yeah. No, this is more from like the project side. Um, so yeah, I do that. And it's kind of like project management as well. Um, and then also small building company we work on sort of projects, which are like around the, well, our last kind of projects were in about the 300K regions, and we're hoping to obviously grow that number, but we're relatively new, having just uh, registered our company in December last year. And then obviously the podcast. So we see, I see a lot of different people from different backgrounds, but the strongest community without doubt is the one around the podcast and the people building the tech and construction. Yeah, it's amazing. You really are at the forefront of the forefront. Because you're you're right there. You're hearing about it every day. You're having those conversations. So it's one of the reasons I'm super excited about our conversation today, because you have a completely different perspective than most people have, just because you're right in the middle of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're from both. I can see it from both sides, right? On one hand, it's like I'm in the company, which we're trying to implement technology in, which is like extremely difficult. And I'm also talking to the people that are trying to implement technology or like have a product or software that they want to try and implement inside a company. And I'm there like, you do realize how hard this is, but yeah, you know, <laughs> until you get there, then you got to try and deal with it. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask a million dollar question and that is what makes a construction champion? Yeah. The million dollar question. Well, you know, before we chat, you, you mentioned this would be the million dollar question. So with that and my kind of way I deal with things is I had to do a little bit of preparation. And the conclusion I got to was that there's more than one answer, right? Because within construction, we have such a vast industry. We've got people that are like on one one end, we had the guys on site, like digging the holes, um, doing the manual work. On the other end, you have the people who are like funding the projects, um, making these things happen. So I wouldn't necessarily say that the people at the, like the the should we say the the like consumer and the people paying the money are the champions because it's a little bit more transactional for them. But for me, it's more the people that are boots on the ground, um, making this industry happen. And then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're 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 on the 
tech side of things. So for me, it's got to be the change makers, the people that are like, really pushing this industry to the limit. Um, you know, we have a dusty old industry. People are resilient to change. Things take time. Um, but we also have people within that ecosystem, like the innovators and the, the tech people, people like you, the content creators, um, the people trying to bring it to the 21st century or by the time we get there, it'll probably be the 22nd century, but that's a separate discussion. <laughs> um, yeah, we're all trying to do something better for the industry and not just settle for what is good today because, you know, things happen fast and we need to make sure we're keeping up and uh, keeping on top of things. So, yeah, as I mentioned earlier as well, the community on the tech side, I personally see being way stronger than um, like the communities that are in the other sectors of the industry. Like one, one of my personal gripes is, especially, I don't know if you guys get this in the US, but there seems to be like a an offsetting of risk uh, mechanism within the industry whereby everyone is always just trying to push risk down to, down to the contractor so the guys on site actually doing the work. Do you get that? Uh, I understand what you're saying. I don't, I what well, they're just always trying to push risk down. Like yeah, so always push it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But there's only one spot where it can ever really end up, and that's down in the field because that's where the most risk lies. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and I really don't appreciate that way of working. I think that people, if people were doing their jobs like correct from the start, and the, the I, like, there's various problems as to why this happens, but um. What's not great is that lack of collaboration where like everyone's like, it's not my problem. And like you say, the only way it can be dealt with is by the people on site doing the work. And that's totally unfair. And that mm -hmm. that blocks a lot of innovation. Um, it restricts people's budgets because like they're having to pay out for all these unknown things that they didn't know at the start of the project. Um, so yeah, I think the people people that are like pushing for a more collaborative approach are the ones that we could probably call construction champions. I love that because to me, that's what changes the industry, like bringing collaboration into this and looking at this from the angle, like how do we just do this better to your other? Like that's the foundation of this podcast. So this is going to be a fantastic conversation here today because we definitely align on this so being that, I mean, you're at the forefront of this with technology, your podcast and everything is how, how do we continue to move the ball or how do we move the ball farther when it comes to collaboration? Because it's almost like that can be a bad word. Like that's a full mm. out of word in the construction industry sometimes. Mm. It's tough. We have to keep trying. I think naturally some of it will come with a generational shift. So I think the like younger generation coming through the advocates for technology, naturally these people tend to are more are more collaborative. I, I like I, I just see that people are more willing to work together to make this happen. Um, at least in the circles that I involve myself with, whereas before it was kind of like like hard business, hard nosed businessmen like all doing it for a profit. Um, but I see you know like academia coming together with like. Uh, innovation funds and start founders to try and do something which is um which is really revolutionary for the construction industry so collaboration is tough um there is no silver bullet i wish i had the answer um i don't and this goes for a lot of things when trying to change the industry there's, there's like in the uk we have contracts which even have clauses in them that are like uh collect they called a supplemental provision where you can add this like a contractual clause into a contract which promotes collaboration but it's all just bullshit like no one looks at it and goes like yeah just that clause is in the contract let's be more collaborative you know um and one way they try to do that like with the collaboration side of things is introduce things like bim um but then as you all know that is like that's been around for i was doing some research into this and like BIM was first mentioned like over 50 years ago or something, but it's really only been trying to get into the industry in the last 20 years and we're still not there. So that's like a, that's for me is the perfect case study about how slow it takes for things in construction to change. So all we can do is persist 
keep trying um hopefully some dramatic piece of technology comes out which suddenly everyone is like yeah we're super collaborative now but i don't think that will happen there's many difficulties around that um main one being really is like the siloed structure of, of how we do things in construction you know you have a project team they end up creating a great project together and then they're straight on to the next project and that team kind of disperses and like there's different people and, and everything that they've learned together and worked and built that bond it's just kind of disappeared so i don't know maybe it needs a whole shake up of how construction projects are run but again i don't have many ideas about how that looks i'm sure we could do some deep thinking to see how that would look but whether it would happen or not is a different question yeah, you know what's amazing? You bring up like the, the teams working together on projects. So, I mean, I've been there. I've been part of those teams and I've been guilty of breaking those teams up as well. That's a, that's a fascinating point that you bring up there because in the construction industry, we do that. Like we do break up our high performing teams to try to create other high performing teams. Yeah. But I, I never I've never thought about it in that way. Like, but that is very, now that I'm standing here thinking like, where else do they really do that? I don't know how many other industries where they take a team that performs very, very well. And then you move on to the next projects and then that team gets dispersed. Either they go somewhere else or you move them to different parts of different projects and bring in new people. So it's like starting from ground zero again to build all of that up. And that that's fascinating to me because like I said, I've been on those high performance teams. I've been poured off of them and dispersed. And then I've been guilty of being the one that was like, we're going to disperse this team with yeah. the thought that we can create more high performance teams. But mm -hmm. I think it doesn't necessarily pan out that way. It's tough, right? Cause yeah, I think naturally you like, you've got your A players and you're like, well, these guys can go and make other people A players, but I don't know if it really works like that. Um, it, it, I guess it does to an extent, but like, yeah, like you said, we don't really do this anywhere else. Like, you, you were in the army. Could you, could you imagine in the, in the marine? Sorry, if you, could you imagine if like you, like you had some successful operations and then they just completely broke that team up? Like, you're gonna lose that success at some point, surely. And I think a lot of it comes down to our unhealthy culture with uh, driving lowest cost for everything. Like everything in construction, without doubt, is a race to the bottom. And this is like a gripe of mine. I know you'll feel the pain as well because, you know, we read the marketing books and it's like, yeah, if you're competing on price, then your marketing isn't good enough. Well, it's like, yeah, but you obviously haven't worked in the construction industry, dude. Like no good marketing is going to get you away from uh, people wanting everything for the lowest possible cost. So, um, yeah, breaking up teams, you, you know, it happens because people someone else will bid and they're lower cost. So instantly like the good team player gets replaced by the cheaper people. And like, you, yeah, what does low cost mean? Usually lower performance and lower quality. Yeah. And that, I like the uh, correlation to the military. So yeah, I was in the Marine Corps and when you're doing the work up to deploy, cause I was in the infantry, like you were your fire team, your squad, like from day zero until you came back from deployment, unless something happened, if somebody got hurt or it's, like it just stayed the same and it was figure it out, become the best possible team you can. And it's not going to get messed with. Like there, there's just that understanding, like that, that team, that squad, that fire team, all of that is just what it is, what it is figure out how to work the best here out there, who does what the best and create that team. And that's going to go from, like I said, day zero of the work up to when you come back from a deployment. And then at that point in time, you have people getting out. So there's changes that happen, but it's changed. And then boom, day zero, once again, on another work up to deploy. Uh, mm. That's, that's an interesting correlation when I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And uh, yeah, I guess it's not so, it's not, it's probably not as straightforward as I'm perhaps portraying, but this is the kind of uh, struggles we're up against in the industry. So, <laughs> well, yeah, for, from collaboration, here's one of my biggest concerns is we have here, at least, especially in the United States, is we have a lot of guys heading on the back end of their career where they're either just going to retire, they're going to sell mm -hmm. their companies they're moving on 
they're done. They've done their time. It's all, it's awesome. Like, okay, rock and roll. Like that's great. But we all, we have all these young guys that are coming up. Like you talk about the ones that want to be involved, want to collaborate that are embracing technology, but we have this gap in between where that knowledge from the guys is it being transferred to the younger guys? Mm. That's where I feel like we need to come to others. It's why I bring guys like you and everybody on this podcast, because I believe we can get that knowledge and start transferring it and put it somewhere where people can get it and start to have that impact. Because if all that knowledge goes away, that leaves all of these young guys and girls out there having to learn this all by themselves. And I don't believe they have to because the path has already been paved. That yeah. secret sauce has been created and it's time that we disperse it throughout the industry and we start helping the industry move forward to your other. I agree. Yeah. The, um, it's, an, it's, it's actually this specific point has come up a few times on our podcast. It's like, can you emulate the brain of a like 65 year old, uh, you guys, I think you call him like superintendent or we call him like project director, a guy that's been there through the trenches, has literally done the work for like 40 odd years. Can we emulate that knowledge and create like a learning platform for people whereby we, with the rise of language models and um, GPT and stuff like that, where, you know, you're a young student, you, you have a question, like you're having troubles on SAR, whatever, you could just have a like a, well, I guess <laughs> maybe in the future, this will be a video call with the person that doesn't really exist, but they're they're just there in this deep fake kind of brain ai style which you're just having a conversation with them they're giving you all the answers right so i think that's very important and i think it's very it's also very important that we sort out how we're collecting data on construction because we have a lot of it it's just not collected it's connected analogous analogous i can't say that word but it's in a, in a non-digital format and even the digital format stuff we have is very messy and so, like, it's impossible for any useful information that's happened historically on, on projects to be transferred to that generation. So I know now there's a lot of companies that are working on this in order to, like, standardize the data that we have and they can run algorithms and things like that. But there's still a huge gap for that to be um, to be uh, corrected. Yeah, because we have the the access to information, which is something that you can just say as naive as I am coming from the coming from the industry to now being in the software side of things. Like I didn't really, when I was working in the industry, ever think about the amount of information we have and how that could be leveraged long-term if we were collecting that data. And if we started to understand the evidence, like it's, it's pretty amazing. It's another, it's just a fascinating thing. I think we're going to see a lot more of, as the younger generations move in and the technology advances. I think in my experience, one of the, the things that are happening is there's a shift into utilizing technology appropriately when for a long time it was, let's just have technology and mm -hmm. like whatever happens kind of happens. But if you put bad data in or you put bad information in, it actually makes things worse. So mm. I, I think we're finally at a point where people understand that and they're pushing the, the envelope on, let's make sure we're putting in good data because we want good stuff out of this. Mm -hmm. And it's tough, you know, like these technology solutions are, are very rarely out the box. So you don't just install it in a computer and it's like ready to go. It's like, no, you got to spend like, however many months training yourself you then got to use it properly and the chances are like depending on the position of you in your company most likely you know like i don't know if it's the same in the us but in the uk the majority of companies are like very small uh it's like one person perhaps maybe maybe less so they, they don't have the time to start implementing this technology so with the technology becomes comes a need for like either an assistant or even like a champion at that technology to be able to make sure it's being used in your company and then that comes at huge costs and then what happens is in order to in order for it for it to be viable you then need to increase your prices but then we're back to the race to the bottom with uh with um trying to win projects so it's a conundrum it's a conundrum i'm sure we're getting closer to solving it but yeah this is a bit of work to do i think there we we make great strides 
in the right directions, but stuff happens. And then we make, you know, it's like the two steps forward and one step back all the time. And that's just kind of what ends up happening in the construction industry in the last five, 10 years has been very, very good. It's just been growth. And I, we mm. still continue to see that growth happening, but at some point in time, it can't just all be growth. You have to understand other aspects of your business and what does all of that stuff look like. And I, I think what, one of the things that excites me about where I kind of, now I'll kind of go off on a, a side yeah. element because you're in this and I want to know if you're seeing the same kind of thing. So one thing that excites me right now about technology in the construction industry is guys like myself that I didn't think existed but they do. And they're making a big push into the industry. So for the longest time, like my, one of my biggest beefs is with Silicon Valley, just putting out technology that mm -hmm. sounds great, but it falls short. And now I'm, I'm connecting with, and I'm meeting all of these guys that are coming from the industry that are like, I wanted to fix this problem. So I built the software to fix it. And we do this really, really good. That excites me. Mm. Yeah. Um. There, I I see like two sides to that. So, like, you 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 mentioned beef with Silicon Valley, right? You 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 get this um kind of delusion that people from uh or delusional people, should I say, that come from like places like Silicon Valley, and they're just like. Oh yeah, construction's a dusty industry. Like that needs some technology. Let's go build some tech and plug it in, and it will all be good. But they, they are like they have no experience in construction, and it, like I, I was kind of alluding to earlier, it's it's like totally different to, to probably what they used to be working on. So, what a lot of advice is to these companies is, um, you need a founder with construction knowledge. Like you, you can rarely just walk into construction and be like, yeah, we're gonna build a plug plug out like out the box solution um so yeah i i think in terms of like silicon valley providing that technology maybe but i think there's other people out there that can do it like like you people that are actually in the industry um building this that have been there and actually see the problems like your your platform the, the communication tool that you have is like it's so straightforward but it's such a big pain point in the industry like there's there's real real and I genuinely mean this there's like real real use case for it whereas some of the people we speak to or or even I speak to and they have like this really fancy solution it's like yeah it's great but too many buttons like <laughs> it's, it's just it's like I don't think a guy on site is going to be able to use that so it's interesting I think people are learning we're moving towards simplicity hopefully um yeah people I, like I say the bottom line is people are learning and, and we're getting there yeah, I think there's there's all kinds of, of growth happening and people just understand like you can go, it's not as out of box to go out and do something like that and create that solution as it used to be. Like we can go heads up with all these guys. I think to bring it full circle to what we've talked about a lot of the time is that collaboration piece has to happen. If we're ever going to to bring the all the power and the, bring the right solutions to the right people, we have to be willing to coll collaborate together and do amazing things for the industry, in service of the industry. It takes all of us. It's not just about everybody in the industry collaborating. It's also about everybody that's in service of the industry collaborating mm. as well. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Because I wrote a piece about this, like you had, you have contractor A, contractor B, like, and, and contractor A is like highly innovative, but more expensive. And then you have contractor B, which is like equally as good as performing, but cheaper. Like contractor B will win every time because the client doesn't really care about the innovation. And then you can just replace that word with collaboration, right? If a client sees that they're going to be paying more for a collaborative contractor, I don't think it will happen. Like they don't really care. They want their project for a price that that is like as cheap as possible. So, um, yeah. Until I think that seems to be a sticking point. Until we can like do something with that. I don't. I don't know. I feel like I'm full of problems and not solutions. But <laughs> it's like this is the reality, right? <laughs> I think here here in the states. I mean, we. 
I come from being the price leader. Like that was part of our business model was we were not going to be the cheapest, but Mm. we were going to stack as much possible value on everything that we did. And it worked. I, I think it's a hard road to go, but it's worth it. And if you're willing to go down that road, uh, you just got to understand that's always going to be an objection and you can't sell on money. Like you can't sell on price. You have to be selling on emotions. You have to be selling on pain point and the added value reputation, who you are. Like that's, I, I'm still, I mean, the age old industry or the age old adage of people do business with who they like no like and trust yeah and a lot of times that doesn't necessarily come down to price Mm -hmm. what i find is a lot of time the cheaper guys lose a lot of trust uh especially if you can come in after them and then explain why you're more expensive Uh because there's a lot of stuff that's probably left out so that's at least here in the united states uh I think a lot of the same principles work over where you guys are at as well. It's true. Um, but what people tend to not realize is like, you don't, you don't really work out why it's cheaper until it's too late. Right. So, so it's like <laughs> you're six months down in your construction program and then you realize, Oh shit. Like I'm going to have to, the price ends up being the same, right? Yeah. Like the construct, the cost of the project is the cost of the project. So um, yeah, pe- people get that. And, and one thing I would say is, is like, with like tech solutions in, within construction, like my my thought now is that value has to far exceed the cost. Like there's no point it being equivalent to cost. Like people don't just want like a basic improvement. They want like game changing improvements in, in what they're doing. So yeah, like you need something that is providing like tons and tons of value for um for like not necessarily as little cost as possible, but like the 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 comparable value versus cost is is, is a lot high is, is very high yeah i think that that's kind of starting to be across the board is uh not just with technology but with everything like we should always be trying to add have a lot higher perceived value than what the actual price is i mean that's how you get people to just say yes like if, if the perceived value is a lot more, no matter what you're doing, whether it's technology, roofing, siding, uh, mowing yards, whatever that is, it's what's that pain point? What's that perceived value of what you do? Mm, yeah. And then you go into your sales skills, right? So you can check out, I don't know if you heard of the book. I think it's called like $100 million deals by Alex Hormozzi. Like that is like in terms of increasing perceived value, that's a, that's a game changer. <laughs> like. He is a master at that. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously good. Like his content is actually really good. Like it's unbelievable. Get... He he's he's an amazing he does amazing things. Mm. I agree. I'm not fat. Like some of them I'm just, you know, yeah, like, kind of like, oh, you roll your eyes at, but he's actually one of them. Like, you know, I'm gonna listen to this guy because he's got very good content and, and it's very He was on uh he was on Andy Fasella's podcast a while back, Real AF, and his story, I don't, if anybody out there doesn't know his story, you need to go listen to it because it's amazing. It's the prime example of I am just going to be successful no matter what. Mm-hmm. Like everything gets thrown at him. Multiple opportunities to be completely broke, multiple opportunities to be hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and pours it off. Like when everything's against him, just because he wanted to stop, he just, he understood what the outcome he wanted to create. He wanted to stop. Mm, mm, yeah, definitely. I think he, he writes in his book, like something along the lines of he had like, what it was one transaction away or something from being like bankrupt. I can't remember, but there's like <laughs> something to do with his bank balance. And then it like was in negative or something. And yeah. And then from then on, he just grew, but yeah, super, super high risk taker as well. I'm not sure I'm yeah. cut out for that life. <laughs> it can be interesting i tend to be on that side of things like yeah a little bit high risk so <laughs> but man it's been awesome talking today i i've loved the conversation man you got a lot of knowledge in your you're at the forefront of a lot of things like you get to sit on the cusp you probably know of stuff before it's coming down the tunnel 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope so. I hope I hope we get to see some things. A lot of this stuff is uh, wrapped up behind closed doors, and you can't say too much. But yeah, we do see some cool stuff. Um, it's great. Yeah, I mean that's how we met you, right? So we meet some great people, and um, yeah, f fully, fully enjoy it. It's very much a passion project. Uh, I mean, I only really make money out of one of the three things I do, but that's not the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I lose a lot of money doing it. <laughs> that can kind of just be how they work. So, all right, man. How, if any of the construction champions out there wanted to contact you, follow you, how do they go about that? Yeah, I would just say connect with me on LinkedIn. It's Owen Drury. You'll see my name, I guess, on the podcast. Um, but yeah, from there, you then you, you end up in like, not my funnel, but you end up in my uh, place on the net and you can find every other place I'm available. So. <laughs> Awesome. And we'll have some information in the show notes as well for everybody. So Owen, it has been fantastic having you on the show today. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come here and great to uh, reciprocate the appearance. Awesome. All right, construction champions. That's another episode full of information about information, about technology, about collaboration a subject that we talk about on here all the time. So I want to ask a question for all the construction champions out there. You can go on our, our mastermind group and answer this. You can send me a message and answer it is I want to know how many of all listeners are actually collaborating with somebody locally in their area that have decided they're going to be part of the solution and not part of the ongoing problem as the construction industry moves forward. It's not an easy thing. Like Owen said, it, it's definitely an uphill batter that a lot of times feels like it's going to be the 22nd in century. But that sounds crazy even saying that before we even get there. I believe the transition that's going to happen in the next 10 years in the construction industry is going to be the most powerful thing that ever happens. I know you guys have heard me say on here before that in the next 10 years, I feel that guys that are in the construction industry are going to be in the same league as doctors and lawyers, because we're going to change the perception around what the construction industry is. And the only way that happens is if we come together and do it within the industry, come together for everybody that supports the construction industry, come together with each other. It, if you're within support of the construction industry, reach out to me. Let's collaborate. Let's come to other. Let's figure out how we can make contractors and builders' lives better. Because when we start doing that, the industry starts doing it, and we become better to other. So construction champions, make sure you go join our free mastermind group. It's where we're connecting listeners and guests on Facebook. Go to our website, constructionchampionspodcast.com. Check out our partners, our sponsors, everybody that helps make this podcast possible. And until next time, be the champion you were meant to be.